propulsion device designed to get Navy aircraft into the air faster, with heavier loads, and in less space. Jet units, much like bombs in appearance, are fastened to the fuselage. The added power is ideally suited to planes taking off from the confined decks of aircraft carriers. Carrying a heavy load, this Navy plane uses two jets. It takes off in record time. <laughs> Members of the Canadian Woman's Army Corps and workers of the Ottawa Ordnance Depot pack 4,900 Christmas parcels for Canadian fighting men, now prisoners of war in Germany. Each man will receive this special package in addition to regular monthly parcels sent through the International Red Cross. Along with the gifts of food and toilet articles, each package contains special dishes and flatware in bright colors to help relieve the drab surroundings of prison camps. Shipments are addressed to camp leaders, not individuals. Homeland cheer for allied prisoners overseas. Chief of Staff General George Marshall addresses the 26th Convention of the American Legion at Chicago. Emphasizing that this war has reached a crucial stage, Marshall tells these American veterans of 1918 that the pressure on the enemy must never be eased until victory. The Legion's Distinguished Service Medal is presented to General Arnold, Army Air Force's commander. I appreciate the honor that you have conferred upon me. Let me assure you that our 14 air forces operating in the seven corners of the world will echo their appreciation a few days hence when they drop their one million ton of bombs on the Jackson Germans. The president of Uruguay, Dr. Juan Jose Ametzaga, arrives with his official party to participate in military ceremonies commemorating the 119th anniversary of Uruguayan independence. United States attaches and diplomats attend the festivities, among them Ambassador Dawson. Dr. Alberto Guani, Uruguay's Vice President. Brazilian General Goyesh Montero. Cavalry units of the smartly trained Uruguayan Army. Mobile artillery manufactured in the United States and other modern mechanized equipment. Reserve of Uruguay participate with cadets from the Naval Academy. Infantry troops march with their brothers in arms in an impressive tribute in honor of the founding of the Independent Republic of Uruguay.
mass production in the United States is the B-29 Super Fortress, the largest, fastest, and most powerful bomber ever built. On the plant floor, the great planes take shape. Wings fit into place. The 16 and a half foot propeller and the huge wheels are ready. Then somewhere in the American Midwest, the huge B-29s take to the air. Before them, a long trip across the oceans to India, then over towering mountains to China. At a China base built laboriously by thousands of Chinese workers, the first 8,800 horsepower super fortress comes down. General Claire Chenault, 14th Air Force commander, greets the B-29 crewmen. These mammoth planes are part of a new United States Air Force, the 20th, designed to operate anywhere in the world under a single command. On the airfields of China, a mighty aerial striking force assembles. Gasoline is needed, hundreds of thousands of gallons of it, every drop brought in by air. At last, all is in readiness. The 20th Air Force commander, General Kenneth Wolfe, confers with Colonel Harmon, group commander for the mission. A mission which, for the first time, will bring land-based planes over the homeland of Japan. Planes and guns are carefully checked for these long-range bombing attacks. go, the B-29s in action on one of their many missions bringing the war home to Japan. from each of the United and Associated Nations convene in Montreal for the second formal session of UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, to the gigantic task of helping to rehabilitate the wide areas of the world which have been devastated by war, UNRWA brings the principle of mutual aid among nations, a principle successfully tested in this greatest of wars, and now perhaps to become one of the most potent weapons of world peace and security. Speaking just after the conclusion of the Roosevelt Churchill Military Conferences at Quebec, Canada's Prime Minister Mackenzie King welcomes UNRWA delegates to Canada. Nothing could more convincingly demonstrate the determination of the free nations to achieve total victory at the earliest possible day than the conference which has just concluded at Quebec. Nothing could manifest more eloquently than this meeting the resolve of the free nations to relieve as quickly as possible the suffering and want of the peoples of war-stricken lands. UNRWA's Director General, Herbert Lehman, former governor of New York, states the theme of this international conference. UNRWA can receive from this great conference and from the Council what I think the world is looking for, namely, a reaffirmation of the United Nations belief in the high value of common effort for common needs which marked our first council session. This is our declaration of united faith and common purpose. I'm very grateful to you. Thank you.